when we say that we suffer, we usually think that we're on the receiving end of the suffering. It's something imposed on us, something to which we have to submit. In some of our more mature moments, we realize that there are times when we're adding to our own suffering. We see this more clearly in other people than we tend to see it in ourselves. Which is one of the reasons that when we come to the Four Noble Truths in the Buddha's analysis of suffering, it's something we have to take on faith. Because in his analysis, to suffer is an active verb. It's something we're doing actively. It's a choice we make. It's a choice we make badly, out of ignorance. But the suffering is in the activity of clinging. There was a scholarly book a while back that analyzed the Buddhist first noble truth as that suffering was the five aggregates. They went on to say, well, five aggregates cover all of our experience. So maybe the word dukkha doesn't even mean suffering, maybe it just means experience. And the people have taken that idea and they run all over the place with it. But that's not what the Buddha said. Suffering is the five clinging aggregates. Where there are aggregates on their own without clinging, there's no suffering. There may be pain in the aggregates, but the mind isn't suffering. It's because we cling to these things out of passion, out of delight in these things. In other words, we find them alluring. That's the suffering. And it's something we're doing right now. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha doesn't have us try to go back into the past and say, what did I do to deserve an illness, a mental state, a situation in life? Is you can trace those things back or try to trace those things back and you go crazy. In fact, the ignorance that underlies suffering is that you can't trace back and find a beginning point for it. So we're here not to find the beginning points of these things, but to find how we're sustaining them, how we keep them going. And that's something that's happening in the present moment right now, something we're doing in the present moment, which means it's something we can watch. This is one of the reasons why the quality of alertness in mindfulness practice is focused not just on the present moment in general, whatever happens to pop up in the present moment, specifically on what you're doing. That's what alertness is supposed to focus on, because that's what's important. And that's for the level of suffering in the mind. The Buddha says to watch it and see it go up and down. Now, where are you going to watch it best? Well, watch it best when you're getting the mind into concentration. That's where you're least distracted. Get the mind to settle in, have a sense of well-being, so you become more sensitive to slight instances of stress or suffering. And then you try to notice them come up and down. When they go up, ask yourself, what did I do? When they go down, what did I do or what did I stop doing? That's how you're going to see the cause. At the same time, that's how you're going to see the allure. We don't think that we'd like to go for suffering, but it's all part and parcel of the same thing. In John Cha's images of a snake, you see the snake has two ends. There's an end that has teeth and the end that doesn't have teeth. And so you figure that the end without teeth is a safe end to, to catch hold of, without realizing, of course, that the end without teeth is connected to the end with teeth, and then the end with teeth will turn around and bite you. We grab after the aggregates, we grab after the lure of the aggregates, then they bite. And the irony in all of this is that the aggregates themselves are things that we put together. We've got potentials coming in from the past for feelings and perceptions and fabrications and form and consciousness. And then for the sake of having aggregates, we fashion them together. The poly in the, that particular suit is rather strange. We, for the sake of feelingness, for the sake of formness, for the sake of perceptionhood. It's a strange statement, but the important part of that is the for the sake of. We have a plan for these aggregates, maybe a confused plan. 
but we put them together for a purpose. We want some pleasure out of them. And if we find the pleasure, we grab hold of them. And oftentimes if we find that they're producing pain, we grab hold of them as well, because we're afraid that if we don't grab hold of these things, what is there? We identify ourselves with our grabbing hold, with our feeding off of these things. And our fear is if we stop feeding off these things, we won't be. We won't exist. So our very sense of who we are and what we are gets all tied up in this, which makes it hard to separate these things out, because it's like it's taking off your arm or taking off your leg to examine it. This is where the analysis of your sense of self into a whole committee of selves is useful. You try to identify with the self that is doing the, doing the concentration, and any other self is going to come up and propose that you go off and enjoy some of the hindrances. You can disidentify yourself with that particular self and then take it apart. Take off the arms and legs. Try to say, where is the allure there? Why do I go through for these things? And because the mind has many layers of deception, you're going to have to look at this again and again and again. But again, that approach of watching the level of stress go up and watching it go down and trying to figure out, what did I do just now? That's one of the ways in which you pull these layers away. Because it's right at that moment that you're actually making the choice. Now, if you looked at it a few seconds later, you might come up with another reason for why you did something. We're very good at making up reasons for why we do things. But if you want to see through that make-believe, you've got to watch these things as they're happening. What is the allure right now? And if you see it, you begin to realize it's not really worth it. There's a sense of dismay that goes there. You're realizing how stupid you've been. As you develop this sense of disenchantment, well, the word nibida also means the sense you have when you've been eating on something or feeding on something and suddenly realize that you've had enough. You really don't want it anymore. There's a touch of dismay there. But there's also a sense of sobering up. As I said earlier, it's when you see the extent to which you are responsible for your own suffering, that's when you mature. This is why the Buddha was extremely mature. He said, the suffering is, is in what we're doing right now. It's nothing that's being imposed on us from outside. We're the ones who are actively going out and creating it, engaging in it, doing it. And so when you say, oh, this is an activity that's not worth it, and you can drop it. That's how it's droppable, because it is an activity. You just learn how to stop doing it. And if this sense of disenchantment goes deep enough, it's followed by dispassion, and dispassion is followed by release. But you can stop the suffering, because you can stop doing the suffering. So when things come up in life, don't ask yourself, what karma did I do in the past? Or what is somebody else doing to me that's making me suffer? The question is, what am I doing right now? To what extent am I actively creating the suffering? To what extent can I see that it really is true that to suffer is an active verb? It all comes from my own actions. And you see that, and you, have the, you also see the opportunity that you don't have to do those things anymore. That's when you can be free. As for where the outside conditions came in the past, it's no longer an issue. 
because the suffering that you're creating right now is the only suffering that's weighing down the mind. That's something you can stop. <laughs>